What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you've had a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is last night's Oscars, or more specifically, just one aspect of it. And that is the historic moment we saw last night thanks to the movie Parasite and its director, Bong Joon-ho. Last night, the movie Parasite became the first film not in the English language to win an Oscar for Best Picture, beating out other notable titles like 1917, Joker, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and Marriage Story. And on top of that, earlier in the evening, Parasite also won the Oscar for Best Director, Best Original Screenplay, and Best International Feature Film. And in my opinion, just, just seeing the acceptance speeches, right, Bong Joon-ho, how, how appreciative he's seen, and just and blown away that he won these awards, the, the tips of his hat to the other directors, uh, how they inspired him, it, it's hard not to just root for the guy. Though, I, I will say, it is odd that not only could it be nominated in so many categories and actually win Best Picture, but that none of the actors themselves were nominated, which was interesting. Now that said, following this award, of course, there was a ton of love for Parasite. Notably, you had a lot of people happy about the spotlight this put on South Korea and South Korean movies. You even had the South Korean president praising the movie, the award, what this means for South Korea. But on the other side, as always happens, you had people that were angry. You had people saying that Parasite didn't deserve it, it should have been this movie or that movie. And here, what I will say, one of my favorite reactions is one that actually went a little bit viral. It's a video of this guy, Robert Storms, and he seems absolutely livid that Parasite beat out Joker. Which I will say here, uh, I've seen both movies. That is of note for something that we're gonna touch in a second. I also very much loved both movies, but but I will say I would have personally voted for Parasite. So understand, th there is a little bias there, but one of my favorite things was the argument that Robert had. Can someone please raise your goddamn hand and tell me, for the love of Christ, how many fucking people in the United States of a motherfucking America saw Parasite? Okay? I don't know what Parasite is. I don't give a shit about Parasite. Look at United States of America right now. What is more important to our culture than the Joker? About a movie that talks about mental illness not being taken care, taken seriously. About how people in high places look down and frown upon the poor, the poverty, and people with mental illness. And how we need to take this more serious. But no, forget all these fucking social problems that Joker touched upon. Let's have a better woke agenda and let's go full fucking woke. Right, and so the reason those two are my favorite parts is one, I, I love anyone outraged about something they haven't watched, and two, Parasite, some people would argue, actually addressed a number of those things even more effectively than Joker. Right, addressing poverty, injustice, desperation, the, the upper class looking down or just not even thinking of or being disgusted by the lower class, and what the powder keg of all of that going off can look like. Right? And that's a conversation that, that transcends South Korean society, American society. I think this is, this is a thing that we're seeing in a lot of places. And Parasite delivers all of that, in my opinion, fantastically. Not a crazy opinion to have. It literally won Best Picture. That said, Robert and some others also had a secondary grievance. Annoyed the Best International Feature film was also eligible for Best Picture. Now, I personally disagree with that point as well, but you know, opinions are opinions. That said, I'd love to know your thoughts on Parasite winning and winning so much. Also, if you haven't watched Parasite yet, I highly recommend it. It's definitely at least worth a rental. And that's a recommendation whether you're someone looking to enjoy a really good movie or uh, you're an uninformed man-child throwing a tantrum in public about a thing that you never consumed. But nevertheless, you proceeded forward because it maybe felt like a good chance to swing at woke culture, and uh, you ended up being kind of the biggest snowflake of all. At the very least, if you watched a thing that you were commenting on beforehand, you could strengthen your argument. Or at the very least, it might seem like a well-informed opinion rather than you just had your feelings hurt. But yeah, moving on. And then let's talk about two bits of quickie entertainment news. First, just a week after the Super Bowl, the XFL premiered over the weekend. And if you're someone that cares about football, I'd recommend it at the very least a peek at it. Reportedly, they pulled decent TV numbers. Also, if you're watching, don't expect, uh, you know, this isn't the NFL. You're not getting S to your talent yet, but there have been very interesting tweaks to the game that you have seen otherwise on the NFL. One, they changed how kickoffs work in a way that should limit the number of touchbacks and injuries. Two, after a team scores a touchdown, instead of just kicking an extra point or having to figure out if you want to go for a two-point conversion, teams can try to convert from the two, the five, or the 10-yard line for one, two, or three points. Also, things like in overtime, both teams get to try to score five times from the five-yard line. I think of it kind of like a penalty shootout. People that were mic'd up, the sideline commentary, the interviews, it was uh, it was interesting. Obviously, it's just the first weekend, the, the number of teams, everything's really limited. Yeah, something interesting to see if, if it rises, it actually becomes a thing, or if it's gonna crash and fail. Then, in other entertainment news, we saw an update to the seemingly more likely situation that we're gonna see Antonio Brown and Logan Paul fight. A sentence that two years ago would have sounded insane, but 
Here we are, 2020, welcome. And as far as the update, we saw Logan Paul over the weekend drop a diss track on Antonio Brown, and it has been met with seemingly overwhelming support. Less than 24 hours, it got over three million views, and this whole thing so far seems like a masterclass on Logan Paul's part. He's really been able to take this situation from over the past year, where he was kind of seen by many as the bad guy in the KSI versus Logan Paul fight, to now by finding someone that has truly been villainized except by the most hardest of hardcore Antonio Brown fans, and turn himself into the potential hero of this narrative that he has crafted. Just from the, the PR and marketing standpoint, He's done an amazing job. To the point, like I said last time, I'll hate myself a little bit for it, but I would 100% pay for this fight. But yeah, for now we'll have to wait and see if the contracts get signed, and uh, if so, or if not, <laughs> what this circus turns into. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome, brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, a website, an online store, a whatever, make it with Squarespace. Squarespace empowers people to create their online web presence or launch their passion project. And everyone can find a home on Squarespace, from entrepreneurs and small business owners, to photographers, new restaurants, bloggers and vloggers, musicians, actors, fashion designers, and so much more. They all trust and use Squarespace for their website needs, and it's easy to see why. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. Creating a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in platform has never been so simple. Extremely intuitive, easy to use, and with their award-winning marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the place to build a beautiful online presence and run your business, all while getting personalized support from their award-winning customer care team via email or live chat. Whatever you need, they're available 24-7 to help out. And so if you want to make the smart move like many already have, go ahead, start your free trial today over at squarespace.com slash phil, and make sure you enter in offer code phil to get 10% off your first purchase. And the first bit of awesome is it wasn't the Oscars, but I did love Adam Sandler's acceptance speech at the Spirit Awards for Best Male Lead. If you're even remotely a Sandler fan, I recommend you check it out. Then, Corridor Crew gave his VFX artists reacting to Avengers Endgame bad and great CGI. Then we had Parasites Park, Saddam singing karaoke. The Hollywood Reporter gave us a documentary roundtable. Bon Appetit gave us Chris making breakfast sandwiches. We had 50 people telling us what their state is best at. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then, let's talk about this really interesting story that, that involves a debate around fake news, free speech, what is and is not doctored video. And at the center of this, you have Nancy Pelosi, Donald Trump, Facebook, and Twitter. All right, so last week when we talked about the State of the Union, we mentioned the now viral clip of Pelosi ripping up Trump's speech. This, once the speech was over, but it provoked massive responses from both sides. We saw a number of Democrats applauding the move while Republicans condemned it, calling it disrespectful, with the White House Twitter account basically framing this as her being disrespectful to the guests invited by Trump. But what happened from there is actually part of the reason that we're talking about this today. Because last Thursday, we saw President Trump post a video on both his Facebook and Twitter accounts. And essentially what the video does is it shows one of the people that Donald Trump was highlighting or honoring, immediately followed with a clip of Nancy Pelosi ripping up the speech. Then another of Trump's guests is highlighted, and then another clip of Nancy Pelosi ripping the speech. All with the caption, powerful American stories ripped to shreds by Nancy Pelosi. Right, and so in response to this, we saw a lot of Democrats saying that this video is misleading, that it's doctored, calling for it to be taken down. This because they said taking that moment at the end of Donald Trump's speech and then splicing that footage multiple times directly after someone was being honored misrepresented presents what actually happened. But on the other side of that argument, you had people defending the video, saying that what was showcased may not have happened as it was depicted, but was representative of what she did by ripping up the speech at the end. Now, among those defending this, you had people like Chief Executive of PEN America. Their free speech advocacy group hit on a lot of main responses we saw to this video from conservatives, tweeting demanding takedown of this Pelosi video would open door to ban a great deal of parody from Facebook, Twitter, etc. Viewers can tell she didn't rip up speech multiple times in the exact same way. Harsh, nasty, underhanded, yes, but parody often is. We also saw Benny Johnson, the chief creative officer of Turning Point USA, the conservative nonprofit that originally made the video defending it on Twitter, saying, here is how we made it. We took real lines from the president's State of the Union speech and then used a real footage of Speaker Pelosi tearing up Trump's speech as a transition for each clip. That's it, real events that really happened in a timeline. We also saw this kind of unusual public interaction with Pelosi's deputy chief of staff, Drew Hamill, and a Facebook spokesperson, with Hamill tweeting, the latest fake video of Speaker Pelosi is deliberately designed to mislead and lie to the American people in every day that these platforms refuse to take it down as another reminder that they care more about their shareholders' interests than the public's interests. We then saw Facebook spokesman Andy Stone responding to that tweet, sorry, are you suggesting the president didn't make those remarks and the speaker didn't rip the speech? To which Hamill responded, what planet are you living on? This is deceptively altered, take it down. But given that spokesperson's response, it also might not come as a surprise to you that both Facebook and Twitter refused to take the video down. With that same spokesman telling reporters over the weekend that the video did not violate Facebook's new policy from January on manipulated media and deepfakes. And specifically pointing towards a part of the policy that says Facebook will 
remove that kind of content if it has been edited or synthesized beyond adjustments for clarity or quality in ways that aren't apparent to an average person and would likely mislead someone into thinking that a subject of the video said words that they did not actually say. Now, Twitter, for their part, basically said they weren't removing the video on a technicality, with their spokeswoman telling reporters that Twitter's new policies against synthetic and manipulated media that they announced last week will not go into effect until March 5th, and that Twitter will not retroactively review Trump's tweets or others that shared the video. Right, so essentially, everything before then would be grandfathered in. Although notably, it does look like Twitter's new policy will go further than Facebook's. Their policy outlines that it will consider removing or labeling posts, including, quote, whether the content has been substantially edited in a manner that fundamentally altered its composition, sequence, timing, or framing. Which is significant because it seems much closer to the criteria of this Pelosi video. But even with all that said, right, let's say Twitter's policy was in place now. It would be interesting to see what would happen to this video. And honestly, as far as my opinion, having watched through the video, I do agree that it should not be removed. At max, what I would say is that it should be labeled. For me, that feels like the, the most possible and safest middle ground here. But I also say that understanding that I'm talking about the situation in a bubble, not considering the other videos and other stories and just massive disinformation campaigns that we see on Twitter and Facebook. But with that said, of course, I pass the question up to you. Well, what are your thoughts regarding this? And then let's talk about what's happening in El Salvador. So yesterday, the country's president, Nayib Bukele, went into the country's legislative assembly to fight for his proposed plan to increase funding for the military. And while doing this, he was accompanied by a large group of armed military members and police officers per his own order. Reports say that Bukele called a special session to do this and that few legislators actually came to it, but also adding that he actually sat in the chair assigned to the legislative assembly's president to put pressure on lawmakers to approve his plan. And the plan in question is called the Territory control plan, which is a multi-phase effort to reduce crime in the country. And the part that he's pushing for right now is to get a $109 million loan for military equipment, specifically including uniforms, vehicles, and video surveillance technology. Also of note here, in case you didn't know, El Salvador actually has one of the highest crime rates in the world, but it's also on the decline. And Bukele actually ran for president on a platform of fighting crime, specifically gang violence. And for context here, the country has a population of a little over 6.3 million. And according to an AP report, violence was at its worst in 2015 with over 17 killings a day. But but they have since gone down. In 2018, there were around nine killings every day. Also, since Bukele took office in June, that number has been cut in half. It's down to 4.4. And here, the president and his supporters say that the decline is a direct result of their efforts to combat crime and gang violence. This, including heavy police presence in public spaces, increased arrests of alleged gang members, and exerting more force on prisons. With Bukele arguing that this loan for military equipment will further help his plans. And in addition to calling on military forces to support him with their presence in the legislative assembly, he also urged other supporters to turn out as well. And it seems they did, with the BBC estimating that around 50,000 pro-government demonstrators came out. And according to Reuters, while leaving the building, Bukele essentially gave legislators one week to approve the loan, saying to his supporters, if those shameless people don't approve the plan of territorial control, we'll summon you here again next Sunday. However, his act of coming into the legislative assembly with military forces was met with a lot of criticism. You had opposition leaders calling this an unprecedented act of intimidation. You had the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights calling for dialogue and full respect for democratic institutions to guarantee the rule of law, including the independence of the branches of public power. Amnesty International also released a statement condemning Bukele, saying the ostentatious police and military deployment in the Legislative Assembly reminds us of the darkest times in El Salvador's history and raises international alarm over the future of human rights in the country. The government and the Legislative Assembly must ensure that their decisions are taken in accordance with national and international standards without compromising the institutions that should protect the human rights of all people without distinction. The Salvadoran people do not deserve to relive years of tragedy and state abuses. Now, as of recording this video, the Legislative Assembly is supposed to meet today, but reports say that they do want more information on the loan before they approve it. With this, they also accuse Bukele of acting like a dictator trying to force his agenda. And my reaction to this story is, yeah, I think it would be pretty much impossible to argue this is anything but an act of intimidation. You have heavily armed soldiers and police going into Parliament, surrounding the room. That sure sounds like an authoritarian move, or at least some move that gets you closer to one. But yeah, ultimately, that's where we are. We're gonna have to wait to see what happens. And of course, I'd love to know your thoughts on this especially if you're from or you have family in that area. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. Thanks for watching, liking, subscribing. Also, if you're not 100% filled in, you want more to watch and catch up on my latest podcast or maybe just miss the last Philip DeFranco show you want to catch up, you can click or tap right there to watch either of those right now. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. I hope you liked the video. Subscribe if you like it.